Um, I call, decided to call this talk, Health Reform, a play in three acts, tragedy or comedy, yet to be determined. I chose that title uh, with the literal meanings of comedy and tragedy in mind. In tragedies, of course, the hero dies. In comedies, the hero survives. The hero in my story is the health reform bill that was passed last year. I use the term hero in the traditional sense to mean a character who, in the face of danger and adversity or from a position of weakness, displays courage and the will for self-sacrifice, that is, heroism, for some greater good for all humanity. That definition, it seems to me, comes very close to characterizing what the President and Congress had in mind with the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act or as it's come to be known simply as the Affordable Care Act, or for short, the ACA. Like many dramatic heroes, this one is flawed, seriously flawed. But if the drama in which the ACA is the central character turns out to be a tragedy, that is, if the hero dies, it will, in my view, indeed be tragic. My title also refers to a play in three acts, and here too I'm being literal. The fate of the ACA is being played out in three acts. Uh, interestingly, and this is a rather odd play because all three acts are being performed simultaneously. I'd like you to imagine yourself in a theater where the audience sits inside a closed triangle of three stages on which the actors are speaking their lines and playing out their parts all at once and without very much regard for one another. Things are pretty chaotic and it's sometimes hard to tell exactly what is going on. To heighten the tension, the concluding scenes on all three stages, the lines that will determine the hero's fate remain to be written. Not to be too coy about it, the stages are respectively the courts, Congress, and 50 state capitals. One reason why the unfolding events are so exciting uh, is that some of the decisions that were made by those who drafted the ACA may be charitably described as of dubious wisdom. I'm going to start with the courts. So far, the drama has consisted of independent decisions by five judges in separate U.S. district courts. The five have ruled on the constitutionality of the requirement that most people show that they are covered by health insurance. Three ruled that the requirement is constitutional, two that it is unconstitutional. Perhaps not incidentally, the two district court judges who ruled the individual mandate unconstitutional were appointed by Republican presidents. One of those two ruled that the coverage requirement is so central to the entire bill that the whole Affordable Care Act uh, is therefore unconstitutional. The other said, that while the individual mandate can't stand, the rest of the bill, including notably the expansion of Medicaid coverage, could stand. Now that distinction uh, is pretty important. The Medicaid expansions can work by themselves and they will become insurance coverage for an estimated 16 million people. That is roughly half of the expansion in health insurance uh, under the whole ACA, according to estimates of the Congressional Budget Office. Still, ruling the individual mandate unconstitutional would be, if not fatal, then deeply damaging to the objectives of the ACA. The reason is that without the individual mandate, uh, the possibility of creating balanced insurance pools under the health insurance exchanges would almost certainly fail. 
Uh, so would the requirement that insurance companies insure everybody who comes in to buy insurance. Uh, the provisions that bar them from canceling coverage once they have issued it and the limits on the variation in premiums by age or other factors. Without the mandate that people carry coverage, the economically sensible thing to do would be to go without insurance until you're ill and then to apply for it. Once cured, you would cancel your coverage. You'd get all the coverage you ever need and pay premiums only a few weeks or months. Well, under those circumstances, insurance markets would become untenable and the budget costs of insurance subsidies would be exorbitant. Without the individual mandate, the coverage extensions other than those through Medicaid would also become untenable. Two of the five cases, one that ruled the individual mandate constitutional and one unconstitutional, have, uh, went to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and was argued before a randomly selected three-judge panel. Uh, it happens that supporters of the Affordable Care Act got lucky in this circuit. Of the three judges, two were appointed by President Clinton and one by President Obama, although most of the judges in that whole circuit uh, had been appointed by Republican presidents. Reports have it that the judges were harder on the lawyers arguing against the constitutionality of the individual mandate than on the lawyers defending it. The next case uh, was heard by a panel of judges, uh, two of whom had been appointed by Republicans and one by Democrats, and the reports are that defenders of the individual mandate had a tougher time of it in that hearing. The final appeals court will include, as it happens, one judge uh, and two others, of course, but one judge who was appointed to positions both by Republican and Democratic presidents. Now, who happened to appoint a judge is some guide to how they'll vote, but it is, of course, far from conclusive. And all observers agree that we are now simply watching the preliminaries. The main event will take place before the Supreme Court, probably sometime next year, with a decision likely around June of 2012, just in time to tee up the issue for the 2012 presidential and congressional elections. There are three points about this litigation that are worth noting. First, the one decision ruling the whole un law unconstitutional results from a legislative drafting error of almost unbelievable negligence. It is standard practice in drafting complex legislation that's likely to be litigated in court to include a so-called severability uh, pr provision. That those provisions say that if one a part of the bill is ruled unconstitutional, that ruling will not automatically apply to other provisions. Most provisions of the ACA are clearly constitutional, and there's no doubt, for example, that Congress has power to regulate insurance. It's done it before, it'll do it again. To have failed to include a severability provision uh, amounts to something close to political negligence or malpractice. Second, the court litigation should remind everything, everyone, that much in law is about form rather than substance. There isn't any real question that the Constitution gives Congress authority to enact a tax law that would have been indistinguishable in substance from the so-called individual mandate. How, you may ask? Well, it's simple. Congress could have imposed a tax on every legal resident equal to the maximum penalty uh, under the Affordable Care Act imposed for failing to carry insurance. But then, of course, suspending the tax for anyone who showed that he or she had 
qualifying insurance. Uh, that's not just my view. It happens also to be the view of the lead and winning attorney in the Florida case where the judge ruled the whole ACA unconstitutional. Uh, he stated as much uh, and expressed the view that a tax law of that nature would unquestionably have been constitutional. But taxes are not very popular these days, nor have they ever been. For years, Republicans have accused Democrats of being the party of tax and spend. Democrats have become rather leery of suggesting taxes unless absolutely necessary. And so, when the ACA was in gestation, the Democratic leadership in Congress decided to enact the mandate that people carry insurance under the clause of the Constitution that empowers Congress to regulate interstate commerce. The Constitution also authorizes Congress to enact laws necessary and proper uh, to affect such uh, regulation of interstate commerce. Now on the question of whether the Commerce Clause authorizes the individual mandate, extremely well-trained lawyers disagree. Opponents of the mandate hold that Yes, the Commerce Clause authorizes Congress to regulate activity that is interstate in nature, but they say it doesn't empower Congress to regulate inactivity. And they say the failure to buy insurance is inactivity. They assert that if the government can force people to buy health insurance, there is no limit to what the government can force people to buy. Supporters respond that, well, virtually everybody buys health insurance at some point in their lives, and virtually everybody uses health care at some point in their lives. Failure to be insured, then, simply forces costs that one person generates onto others and makes them pay for whatever care was provided and not paid for. That, of course, has a direct impact on insurance, which Congress uh, unquestionably has the power to regulate. And so they say Congress can require insurance just as they can regulate other activities that one way or another affect things that uh, move in interstate commerce. The third and ironic fact is that the whole fight over the individual mandate could and in my view should have been avoided. The way out was suggested by Princeton sociologist Paul Starr back in mid-2009. Even then it was pretty obvious that the idea of a mandate was controversial. Well, more than controversial, it was not very popular. Starr proposed that people should be free not to buy insurance now if they so choose. But if they didn't buy insurance, then they should face penalties for that refusal. In particular, they should be barred for several years from receiving insurance subsidies. They should also be barred from uh, buying insurance through uh, the health insurance exchanges or under the insurance protections, such as those in the Affordable Care Act. In particular, insurance companies should be free to charge them as much as they thought uh, their coverage should cost and to cancel coverage if the insurance company wished. Now such penalties would not, uh, according to most estimates, have assured universal coverage, but they would, Starr argued, maintain a sufficiently robust insurance market and a sufficiently broad and general pool of purchasers of insurance to, in, to sustain the insurance market reforms. This, there is a unanimous agreement about that. MIT professor John Gruber, whose analyses are always to be taken very seriously, has argued that they, the, those kinds of penalties would not work as effectively uh, as a flat out requirement would. But I think we know for sure that they would have worked better than a mandate that might be found unconstitutional 
or that the political system may be unwilling to sustain. In any event, this is a precy of the drama playing out on one of the three stages. We're in for a lengthy Bite Your Nails performance. The final script on the judicial stage will be written by six men and three women wearing black robes, probably in about 13 months. Well, there's the second stage. And on that stage stand 535 members of the US Congress. But actually, that understates the complexity. In addition, their members of the executive branch are also present, struggling with the administrative challenges of implementation. And actually, we have two US Congresses on the stage, the one that is in office until the end of 2012, and the one that will take office in 2013. Both count as the major provisions of the Affordable Care Act will not be implemented until 2014. As if the debate about the Affordable Care Act were not uh, complicated enough, it has become politically enmeshed in the seemingly unrelated but equally divisive debate about whether and how far to raise the U.S. debt ceiling. As part of that debate, House Republicans, led by Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan, have proposed to repeal not only the Affordable Care Act, or most provisions of it, but also to replace Medicare with insurance vouchers for the elderly and disabled, and to convert Medicaid from a federal matching grant into a block grant of a fixed amount. All but a few House Republicans voted for these proposals when the House leadership brought them to a vote, and when the Democratic leadership brought it to a vote in the Senate, most Republican senators did so as well. These budget proposals are relevant because they may well have a first-order effect on the nature of the Congress that is seated in 2013. Right now, Democrats have a 52-48 majority uh, in the U.S. Senate. But up for re-election in 2012 are 22 Democrats uh, and just 10 Republicans. Those are great odds for Republicans and lousy odds for Democrats, uh, particularly since some popular Democratic incumbents from purple states, that is states that usually have voted Republican but voted Democratic, in the last couple of elections, uh, won narrowly uh, when they were seated in 2006, uh, but are going to face a very hard time of it uh, this time uh, going around. The hope among Democrats is that the Ryan plan is a poison pill for Republicans. Vote against it, and you anger your base. Vote for it, and you may anger most everybody else. Well, meanwhile, the executive agencies have uh, a formidable task of their own to implement health reform. The job is challenging for two different reasons. First, Republicans want to deny the administration funds to staff the work that has to be done to plan implementation. It's not clear whether they will succeed, uh, but even if they fail, uh, the administration faces some extremely knotty problems. I'm going to focus on one knot that will be something close to hell to untie. Uh, now, I, in doing this, I have to get really down and dirty in technical program detail, but please bear with me. The Affordable Care Act provides subsidies to people with incomes that are below four times the federal poverty threshold. Uh, that's to help them buy insurance, of course. The subsidy amounts just have to be based on anticipated income. They couldn't be based on past income because that would mean that people who had just lost their jobs and health care uh, might not be uh, uh, eligible uh, to receive subsidies. So income. Uh, 
the income used for computing subsidies has to be prospective. If it's low enough, you qualify for help, but the help doesn't go to you directly. It goes to the insurance company from whom you buy coverage so that they can keep the premiums low to you. Well, quite naturally, Congress and taxpayers don't want to pay subsidies to people who are not really eligible. So it's necessary to recover improper payments made to those whose incomes turn out to be too high. But the recapture, the recovery of subsidies, has to be based on actual income for the year that the, during which the subsidies are paid, and not on the guess that formed the basis of payment in the first place. Many people with low enough current income at some point in the year to qualify for subsidies will turn out to have earned enough by the end of the year uh, to be ineligible for as much subsidy as they received and possibly not eligible for any subsidy at all. These people will have to repay some or all of the subsidies that they received. These overpayments will not and cannot be collected from the insurance company to which they were initially paid and that, because they provided the insurance coverage already. They have to be recovered from the insured individual on whose behalf they were paid. Well, to avoid getting, uh, going after large sums of money, the Affordable Care Act placed a dollar limit on the maximum recovery. And even with that limit, which wasn't too high, the potential political backlash from trying to collect overpayments from people who never dreamed they might have to give back subsidies they had never actually seen had folks in the administration deeply perturbed. Then another shoe dropped. As you will recall, there was a large kerfuffle at the end of last year about fees paid to physicians under Medicare. Large uh, cuts in those fees ca were called for under a law that had been passed many, many years ago and they were about to take effect right at the end of last year. Well, in the, this wasn't the first time. Congress had uh, confronted this problem in the past and, as previously, had waived these cuts. But under current rules that govern uh, the way the Congress operates, it could waive those cuts only if it offset the cost of doing so in some other way. So Congress, in its wisdom, if that's the right word, paid for this cost by raising the maximum amount that can be collected from each person who receives too much by way of subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. And that's where things stand right now. It illustrates and exemplifies the very, very hard work that remains to be done in order to plan implementation. There is time to do it, two and a half years, but the executive agencies can't do any of it without staff and they can't do it without money. The ACA contains some money uh, that would pay for some staff, but not enough to do the whole job. And Republicans in both the House uh, and the Senate, uh, in the House where they have a big majority and in the Senate where they have enough votes to filibuster indefinitely, don't want the administration to have either. What this means is that on the second stage, we're going to spend the next few months watching a game of political chicken. Perhaps a better analogy would be a football game in which there is a loose ball and a lot of large, really rough men form a large pile to fight over who gets control. We, the viewers, never see exactly what goes on inside that pile, but it isn't pretty. Nor do I think that the fight over what happens with the ACA is going to be uh, any less rough and unattractive. Whatever happens this year is not going to be the end. Opponents of the ACA are out for its repeal, 
They can't really get it before 2013 because President Obama would surely veto any such bill, even if it were to pass Congress, which seems also virtually impossible. Whether they get it uh, in 2013 or later will depend on what happens on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November 2012. Given the number of Democrats and Republicans up for re-election that year, and where the contests are, it seems likely that the repeal forces may well gain some additional advantage. Which brings me to stage three. The 50 state legislatures and governor's offices where responsibility resides for forming the health insurance exchanges and for expanding Medicaid enrollments. That's where more than 12, 32 million currently uh, uninsured Americans are supposed to get health insurance coverage or Medicaid benefits. Now, at this point, I want to make an assumption that's patently false. Um, we economists are not bad at doing that. I'm going to assume that all state governors and legislators, with the best of will, would want to make the Affordable Care Act work. Never mind that dozens are now suing in court to repeal uh, that bill and that many others have passed legislation uh, that would uh, hamper or the bill's implementation or that reject it entirely. Even with the most wholehearted cooperation, the states also face really formidable administrative challenges. The first is to enroll roughly 16 million more people under Medicaid. The mechanics of enrolling this many people uh, are extremely difficult. But let's suppose they get enrolled. The challenge then is to make sure that they can actually see a doctor and get in a hospital if they need care. As it happens, the states that will increase their enrollments most uh, also have lower than average numbers of primary care physicians. And many states pay doctors so little under Medicaid that physicians refuse to see Medicaid patients altogether. So state governments also have to induce enough doctors to see Medicaid enrollees to make enrollment more than a tease. And many states pay hospitals so little that covering unreimbursed costs is a major challenge for hospital administrators. Uh, the federal government, to be sure, is covering virtually all of the incremental costs at current cost levels of, co of the additional enrollees. But it isn't covering much of the additional costs that may be necessary uh, to ensure that financial access uh, translates into genuine medical care access. States are also being charged with establishing health insurance exchanges. These are the administrative entities through which people not covered at work or through public programs will buy insurance that, uh, and that will determine the subsidies that the federal government will pay to these people. The exchanges will have to regulate the way in which health insurance pools are formed and what policies may be offered. They may regulate marketing of insurance as well. They have a great deal of flexibility and practices will vary enormously from one state to the other. And this is where my false assumption of goodwill on the part of state officials uh, begins to bite. Uh, that goodwill is not universally present. In fact, many states have adopted a stance reminiscent of the massive resistance with which some southern states greeted desegregation of the public schools. The problem is less with those states where the officials flatly refuse to do anything. The ACA in that case authorizes the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services to step in if the states simply just say no. In that case, 
uh, responsibilities would shift to the federal government and would be clear. The larger problem is with those states uh, in which uh, cooperation is slow, half-hearted, underfunded, and understaffed. In those states, the results come 2014 could well be chaotic. So that's the end of my theater review. Um, I want to welcome everybody to this three-stage performance. The stage is replete with villains, although who they are depends on your point of view. The tension is going to be intense, so please stay in your seats. Whatever the denouement, this political drama is without close rival the most intense, dramatic, pivotal, and nerve-wracking domestic political show that I have seen in my lifetime, and I shall shortly celebrate my 75th birthday.